Uh, Kate Kelly, uh, great reporting. I'm not hopeful that anything happens. I've always thought the easiest way to handle this is for the SEC to actually take it up, but they don't want to take it up because guess who manages their budget? These guys. See you later, <laughs> Kate. Thanks. Thanks, hey, Andrew. Let's talk about uh, another story. It's actually on the front page of today's New York Times uh, right here. Yeah. You see it. Uh, now the latest. It's uh, a lot of pain for them yesterday. Big story about uh, the congressional stock trading <laughs> they lost um, money. mess that we've been talking Bad about day. on the show for a very long time. Uh, the report uh, tracks tens of thousands of trades from members of Congress and their families. They found that 97 current senators or representatives reported buying or selling stocks that conflicted with their work or congressional committees. Joining us right now is one of the authors of the investigation, an old friend of the program, Kate Kelly, of course, from the New York Times and a CNBC contributor. Kate, uh, let's sort of walk through the details here of just how bad it is. And, and most importantly... There's the perception of bad, which is to say perception of conflict. And then there's, of course, the issue of real conflict. And I'm curious what you found in terms of the distinction between the both of those. Well, first of all, Andrew, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk about this analysis. Um, I think I have to say up front, I mean, we did not find anybody that we know was insider trading. If we had, we would have said so clearly. And, uh, you know, in this case, what we're looking at is a lot of perceptual conflicts. And, you know, some situations, uh, Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Mike Kelly comes to mind, that have been investigated by congressional ethics officers and referred to the Committee on Ethics you know, there are some transactions that have raised eyebrows, but for the most part, what we did was take a look at the combination between a congressman or senator's committee assignments and the stocks and sectors that they or their immediate family members were trading that a reasonable person could argue dovetail with those committee right. assignments. So in other words, if you're on the Armed Services Committee and you're trading Raytheon and Northrop Grumman, that might reasonably be seen to be a potential conflict because you could right. be in possession of non-public information occasionally or even regularly. What percentage of the folks who you identified as doing this said to you, you know what, it wasn't me. It, I didn't do the trading myself. I use, a, I use an outside firm that does all of this. I, it's a completely hands-off situation. Or I have a spouse that did this, uh, but they do that professionally, and so it's a different situation. I mean, what kind of explanations did you hear, and which ones were believable to you and which ones weren't? We got a large percentage of people saying my broker or my spouse does this without my knowledge. Um, there was a small handful that said, I do this. I own it. I think further restrictions are ridiculous. Uh, Steve Cohen, Democrat of Tennessee, had that tone. Um, Tommy Tuberville, Republican of Alabama, had a little bit of that tone. Uh, but most people, the vast majority, I should say Tuberville trades through a broker, but he thinks further restrictions are, quote unquote, ridiculous. I'm just saying most people uh, said their broker is empowered to do this and they have no knowledge of it. So we've talked, for example, to Rokana on this broadcast about this issue. He always uh, sort of refers and says, not me, somebody else. Um, did, was there anybody on this list who said, yeah, let's let's change the law? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, the, the potential law that we featured in the story is called the Trust in Congress Act. And this is sponsored by Abigail Spanberger, Democrat of Virginia. But she has, at last check, 67 co-sponsors, including a number of Republicans. So that's that's a decent chunk of people who say everybody should either divest before they start service in earnest. I mean, you can wait until after you win your election and you're sworn in, but like in pretty short order, you have to either divest or put your assets in a qualified blind trust. And there are some 10, 12 uh, different bills floating around the Senate and the Congress with various approaches to this issue. Um, and you might be surprised by the range of sort of political thinkers that sponsor these. Josh Hawley has sponsored a bill, Ben Sass. Um, and then you have moderates like Spanberger. You also have Elizabeth Warren, who has co-sponsored a bill. Actually, I think this is the only one that was co-introduced by a Democrat and a Republican. Her partner is Steve Daines. So there seems to be, anecdotally speaking, a lot of support. And even quantitatively speaking, I don't know, 80, 90, 100 members out of the 535 who have actually attached their names to some legislation. So you think, well, if you're going to handicap this, you actually think something's going to get done here? I think it's questionable. I mean, as you know, the clock is running out on this Congress. 
And there's a lot on their plates. Um, midterm elections are going to be a huge time suck. Um, there are compromise efforts ostensibly going on in both chambers. Zoe Lofgren has been asked by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to put together a Democratic sort of comp compromise bill um, that would take a number of issues and address them, not just sort of the qualified blind trust idea, which is in the Spanberger bill, but some other enforcement mechanisms, uh, closing the gaps of reporting mechanisms. I mean, to bring that to life for you, Andrew, if you have a relatively large trade, you report that as between $1 million and $5 million of value. <laughs> I mean, you could drive a truck through that. So as a constituent or a journalist or someone that's interested in transparency, you want more details than that. So they're looking at issues right. like that. But it's unclear that any the, of this gets... The folks who said, the folks who told you there's just no way, I want to trade, I got to trade, I need to trade. Did they say, well, I just, I wouldn't take this job if I wasn't allowed to trade? What was the, what was the argument to you? Well, there is a school of thought that you're going to reduce the amount of talent that's going to come to the Hill if you put these restrictions on. I don't know if that's true or not. Certainly the Senate is a place where you have wealthier people. Um, it seems to me one of the toughest areas here, or there are two of them. One is if you're actually married to an investor, which is the case with Nancy and Paul Pelosi. Uh, Tina Smith of Minnesota, she's a Democrat She's married to a guy who is a professional medical device stock investor. He once was named the Wall Street Journal best on the street. And she's been in the Senate only for a few years. So the idea that your spouse would have to quit their career um, in order for you to do a public service job that, while extremely important, may only have two years of job security, I think is tough. I think the other one is the Ro Khanna example. Ro Khanna's family members made him the single biggest filer that we found. He, his family members traded 10,500 times in the course of our three-year period, which was calendar 2019, 20, and 21. And he had, as a result, a ton of conflicts with his committee assignments just because of sheer volume and because basically they're trading the S&P 500. So his view is that's ethical. I'm certainly not involved. My wife's not even directly involved. It's a diversified trust. But if you say that this can't happen, we'll of course comply with the law. So you could see how there are some tough dinner time conversations around that. But it must be said, Andrew, Two thirds of Americans polled on this issue want to see yep. literal bans on individual stock trading. I think the public view on this is pretty unambiguous.